Chapter 7. The Early Years. Zoe had been eagerly anticipating her next session with Clara. She'd found herself thinking about what they discussed throughout the week. She had to agree with Clara. She didn't think a lot of herself. Not when it came to her love life. She'd never believed that relationships would work out, and when they didn't, it just compounded her beliefs that things never worked for her. She arrives punctually. Clara welcomes her in and she sits down. How are you, Zoe? How has your week been? Clara asks. I'm good. I've been thinking a lot about what you said, about my life. I know I need to change, I'm just not really sure how. I feel like I can help everyone else, but when it comes to me, I've just been a bit useless. Shall we take some time today to talk about your home life and your family in more detail? There's not much to say. They're a pretty normal standard family. I had a really good childhood, Zoe says. I am sure you did, but let's just explore a little. Tell me about your childhood. Okay, my mum Rose grew up in Manchester and moved to London to go to a nursing school. She met my dad, George, who's from South London, at a dance in the Hammersmith Palais. He was a foreman and she was a nurse. She loved her job. They got married pretty quickly, but they were both still really young. She was 22, he was 24. She fell pregnant right away and had us pretty much one after the other. And she gave it all up to be a stay-at-home mum. When we went to school, she got a job as a home help, but she was always home when we got back. She did everything in the house, and I used to help out when I could, once I'd done all my homework. Dad was never really around from what I remember. When he lost his job in the haulage business, he decided to do the knowledge to become a cab driver, but that meant years of him not really working, just trawling the streets of London on his moped. He did do some driving jobs to get a bit of cash, and that often meant him staying away. He did a lot of long-distance stuff. Being self-employed suited him much better, but he did work ridiculous hours. We really didn't see him very much at all. When we did, he was great fun, but he was tired a lot of the time. I always got the impression they were both always worrying about money. It wasn't spoken of, but it was a general undercurrent. She reaches for her glass and takes a sip of water. Emily and Rick weren't much help at all. There was always something Emily needed for her ballet classes or her music lessons, and doing housework was beneath her. And Rick was just always getting into trouble and needing to be bailed out. It was one of the reasons I decided that I was going to knuckle down and do really well at school. School was my refuge. I loved history, economics and languages. I wasn't overly sporty, but I was involved in the school magazine and did some drama and fundraising. I had my heart set on being a lawyer. I watched Ali McBeal and I just knew that was for me. I wanted to help people and defend the innocent. I also needed a good job because money was the one thing I never wanted to worry about. I needed to be able to provide for myself and my family if needed. Clara nods encouragingly. Both mum and dad always encouraged me to do my best. But if I'm honest, dad didn't really get it. He kept pushing for me to get a job on an airline as a stewardess. He thought travel was the answer to everything and quite liked the idea of me marrying a pilot. Free travel for the whole family, he'd say. He never understood me wanting to be a lawyer. He didn't think it was the kind of thing a woman should do, but Mum always told me to go for my dreams. She was very supportive. And your dad, Clara asks. Well, nowadays, Dad, when he isn't working, spends his time eating junk food and watching crap on TV. I think he might be a bit depressed, really. There isn't much in the way of conversation anymore. I think he talks so much in his cab he can't be bothered when he gets home. The London traffic really gets him down and things have got so much worse for him since Uber arrived. He's a bit uncertain about his future. Him and Mum never really talk anymore and I know she's really unhappy about that. They've also been in separate bedrooms for a long time because of his weird hours and I don't think that helps anything. We get an OK and I know he loves me but I think he always preferred Emma. She's more his kind of girl. She was the beautiful, girly one. She never had a hair out of place, and I could see how proud he was of her. She wasn't very academic, but she was clever and confident, and she got herself a job as a PA to a CEO in a bank in the city. She was well paid, and due to her rather controlling, slightly OCD nature, she was brilliant at her job. However, I heard she was never that popular with the other staff members. There was a lot of jealousy, and I think the boss was a bit in love with her and afraid of her all at the same time. She met Miles, her husband, who was a hedge fund manager there, and after a whirlwind romance, they were married in the Seychelles. She now lives out in Hampstead in a really smart house. It got featured in Homes and Gardens. They've got two adorable children who I love to bits. 
we just don't see that much of each other. We've never had a lot in common and that's okay. She has it all sorted and I don't. We're just very different people. Clara nods. And what about your brother? Though he sighs. Oh, Rick. He's the baby. He was a bit of an accident and is about six years younger than me. He is the loveliest person ever. He's so creative, such fun to be around. He is really kind and incredibly talented, but he's a bit of a car crash. He parties too hard, drinks too much, does way too many drugs and sleeps with way too many women. He's quite well known as a photographer after a really lucky break, but just doesn't live in the real world. It's all glamorous parties and locations and he gets paid too much money. I just don't think he can handle it all. Dad thinks he's a bit of a waste of space, doesn't approve of his way of life, and I think in some ways he's probably a bit jealous of him. But he'd never admit that, and that kills Rick. He just wants Dad to be proud of him, and if he can't be that, he just loves to piss him off. They just antagonise each other. It's really sad. If I'm ever in trouble, though, Rick is the one I turn to. He might be completely unreliable, but if I ever really needed him, he'd be there. I just don't see enough of him and I do worry about him. So what would you say your role was in the family? Clara asks gently. I guess I'm the peacemaker, the mediator and the responsible one at home, if not in my own life. I was always the one trying to bring the family together, getting them to talk to each other, because it was never easy. Still isn't. It's not that they don't love each other, I just think they struggle to show it. I felt like I could never do enough. What made you decide to be a lawyer? It was obviously not a traditional role within your family setup. When my dad was sacked from his job, it was unfair dismissal. He was falsely accused of fraud. He couldn't afford a decent lawyer, so the haulage company won the case. It affected everyone, but him especially. He was eventually acquitted, but his reputation was in tatters. I think it was at that point I knew I definitely wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to fight against injustice. But honestly... Some part of me really just wanted to marry a successful hot justice warrior lawyer and have his babies. She grins at Clara, who smiles and shakes her head. OK, I think that's enough for today. But I have an exercise for you. I'd like you to write letters to the people from your early life, particularly your father. You get to tell them exactly how you feel about the things that happened, especially those things that are still causing you pain. You get to vent in a safe way because... These letters will never be sent. They are just a means for you to express your inner feelings. When you're done, you can tear them up and burn them. That way you're releasing it all. Then, when you come back next time, you can tell me how you got on and how you feel. That may end up being a lot of letters. Clara smiles. It's not an exact formula. It's a process. You just keep going till you feel you're done. How will I know when I'm done? Zoe asks. Trust me, you'll know. And with that cryptic comment, the session is over. Meanwhile, on another plane, Robert is still with Jacob. OK, buddy, why don't you tell me a bit about your life growing up? What kind of a kid you were growing up? And your mum and dad? Give me the lowdown, Jacob says. I was a normal kid. Normal kind of stuff, really, nothing special. He was very reluctant to say more. I really want to know. It's going to help us to put the puzzle together and get some answers as to why you're such a schmuck now. Robert shrugs. I don't really remember a lot, to be honest. Maybe we should have a little look and jog your memory then. Oh, God. Not again, Robert asks, incredulous. Jacob winks at him. That's one of the perks of being here. We can see everything, the whole nine yards. Robert starts to look a little worried. A screen appears in front of them, and another movie begins to play. This time, after a few moments of watching, it all comes flooding back to him, and it's as if he's right there, seeing through his own eyes. Robert is sat at the dinner table with his mother, father and sister. It's his eighth birthday. Leo has flown in from the States for business and has managed to attend a birthday dinner at the family home. His mother has made his favourite food, which is roast chicken and roasted potatoes. Due to her nerves and the fact that Leo is an hour late, with no apology, she's burnt the potatoes and overcooked the chicken. His father's being incredibly rude and callous to his mother, humiliating her. He berates her. This food isn't good enough, are you an idiot? All your education and you can't even cook a simple meal. His mother breaks down in tears. 
She starts to protest but gives up when she sees the look on his face. She can see he's about to go into one of his infamous rants and nothing that she can say or do will help or dissuade him. Her best tactic is to remain quiet and not add fuel to the flame. His father dramatically drops the plate of food on the floor and when she starts to cry, he gets even more angry. Oh, this is typical of you, Joan. I'm sick of you crying and being so pathetic. Do you think I just sit round crying when things don't work out for me? No, I go and fix it. All you had to do was look after the kids and put a decent meal on the table once in a blue moon. How difficult can that be? Jesus, woman, it's your son's birthday and you still can't get it right. I despair, I really do. Joan doesn't say a word, just drops her head and crumbles a little more, waiting for the storm to pass. But Daddy, it wouldn't be this way if you hadn't been late. It was all perfect. I know it was because I helped, Sarah says. I will thank you to keep quiet, little madam. This has nothing to do with you. I was taking care of some very important business, snaps Leo. Joan looks at Leo, then at Sarah, who's gone red in the face. She's obviously distressed. Then she looks at Robert, who she knows should be more important than any business. The fact that he isn't makes her even more upset. But she's forced to stuff her feelings back down for fear of more angry outbursts. Robert goes to his mother to try to comfort her. Leo slams his fist on the table. Sit back down. Don't you dare get involved. This is between grown-ups. You need to learn who's in charge. I pay the bills around here. I'm entitled to expect a bloody decent meal when I'm here. And don't let this snivelling fool you. Your mother's just lazy and useless. Do not feel sorry for her. I'm the one that's been wronged here, not her. I work my ass off for this family to put a roof over your head and put food on the table. I'm paying for the damn stuff. The least she can do is make it properly. It's not that hard. Robert is shocked and doesn't know what to do or say. He sits back down, compelled by his father's authority. Come on, Robert. You and I will go to my club, get a decent dinner. My treat for you. Now that you're eight, you'll be allowed. They leave Joan and Sarah behind to clear up the mess. Although still upset, Robert is excited to be able to spend this special time with his father, which he hardly ever gets to do. His father sends him to his room to change, insisting that he put on a shirt and tie and a smart jacket. Robert comes down wearing the suit he'd worn for a recent wedding, his hair combed flat and parted to the side, emulating Leo's. Leo nods approvingly and smiles. You're a good-looking boy, Robert. You take after my side of the family. Robert is struggling with his tie, and Leo takes a moment to help him with it. Robert has heard much about this mythical club, where his father does much of his important business. He's excited and feels as though this is an important moment in his life, a much-needed bonding time with him. The scene changes. Robert and his father are in his chauffeur-driven Bentley. They are sat at the back as the driver drops them off outside his private members' club in Piccadilly. Robert has never seen anything quite like it. It's almost like something out of a fairy tale. He's mesmerised by the grandeur of the entrance and the array of shields and panelled wood on the walls. The smell of the leather chairs and the huge chandeliers. They head straight for the American bar where Leo orders a large single malt whisky for himself and a cola for Robert. Without asking, he orders them both steak and fries, both medium rare. When the meal comes out, there's blood seeping out onto the white porcelain plate. Robert is secretly horrified and disgusted, but doesn't dare say anything. He watches his father wolf down his food and does his best to follow. He manages to eat most of it, but has to excuse himself as soon as he's finished his meal and goes to the toilet and throws it all back up. He's ashamed at himself for being so weak. When he gets back to the table, he's terrified his father will notice. But Leo is far too busy. He's ordered another whiskey and is deep in conversation with another club member. They both order cigars. Robert is gagging at the smell, but is watching admiringly as these two powerful men discuss the latest in politics. They are surrounded by billows of blue smoke. Their attentive waiter, who's been discreetly watching the whole scene unfolding, comes over with a selection of pencils and a colouring book. But Robert politely refuses. He doesn't want to do anything that will make him look childish. He's determined to show his father that he can be trusted, so he can accompany him again to the club. He rarely has time with him and this is a rare treat. 
He sits drinking it all in, fascinated by the way everything happens. The sumptuous decor, the grand high ceilings. And he thinks to himself, one day when I'm grown up, I'm going to be a member of this club. I will eat my steak rare and not throw it up. I'll drink whiskey and smoke cigars. I want to be a real man like my dad. Leo drops Robert home two hours later, way past his bedtime. Robert's exhausted but happy to have spent his birthday in the company of illustrious and successful men. And he's determined to be just like them. His mother rushes forward to sweep him up, but he rebuffs her. Mother, I'm not a child anymore. I can take care of myself. I don't need you fussing over me. I can put myself to bed. Silently, wordlessly, she acknowledges the power of Leo's influence. A tear rolls down her cheek as her son marches away up the stairs. <laughs>